All right, <clears throat> so four cornerstones of value creation. And I apologize, I can't make this full screen because it will kill the YouTube video again. <clears throat> this, these are the major themes for valuation this semester. Cornerstone number one, you don't create value by increasing sales and increasing profits. More revenue, more earnings per share does not lead to a higher share price. Because professional investors are going to ask two additional questions. Question one, how much did you spend to generate those sales and profits? Everything we do is going to go through the lens of return on investment, right? The book is going to call it ROIC, return on invested capital. Some people will call it return on capital employed, ROCE, or return on net assets, RONA. Those are fairly interchangeable terms, but ROIC is the standardized version that's used by Wall Street, and that is what we're going to be talking about this semester. Question number two. How much risk did you generate in order to get that return? We're going to risk adjust everything. And if we think that you took on too much risk relative to the return, we're going to say it's not worth it. That risk adjustment is going to be based on something called the cost of capital. <clears throat> and we're going to use a WAC to estimate the risk. And so value is going to be about what we're going to call spread. It's the difference between your ROIC and your WAC. <clears throat> to create value over time, that spread must be positive. Now, what you're going to find is that's very similar to what you learned in Finance 101 because you learned about internal rate of return, right? ROIC is a one-period IRR. That's all it is, right? Cost of capital is your R. To have a positive NPV, the IRR has to be greater than an R. What you're going to find out is that principle applies in the real world for valuation, as much as it does in the project world for project finance. And so understanding the ROICs over time relative to the cost of capital is going to tell us everything we need to know about the valuation of companies. So that's what the first cornerstone is about. The other thing about the first cornerstone that's important is that basically approximately 50% of a company's ROIC is based on the industry that you're in. The industry is more important than the company from an investor standpoint, right? And I'll just mention this intuitively. If you're in a bad industry, no matter what you do as a company, you may not be able to overcome that. If you're in a great industry, you actually could be a mediocre company and still do well, right? So smart investors look just as much as the industry before they look at the company. Matter of fact, there's a guy named Warren Buffett who's actually done something that we in academics said can't be done. Over a 40-year period of time, investing in individual stocks, Warren Buffett averaged a 20% rate of return on his portfolio, compound annual growth. Right? The S&P 500 index was 10% a year. He more than doubled the S&P 500 index over 40 years. That's hard to do selecting individual stocks. So as Warren Buffett doesn't have that many years left running his firm, we're basically trying to figure out how can we learn from what he did. And one of the things he says is he says, I never invested in companies. I invested in industries because the industries were more important. He then picks the best companies in those industries, but he starts with the industry. Because if it's a lousy industry, there's nothing that the investment will do. And it's not just an industry that's going to do well today. It's an industry that's going to do well tomorrow. So he is future-oriented. All right. So let me give you some data to support what I'm saying. So let's go into Bloomberg. So for now, I'll just use my terminal here on the screen. And let's look up the price of oil. So right now, West Texas crude trading at 46.57 a barrel it's down a dollar 5 today. And here is a graph of 5 years of oil prices through this morning. So basically between 2012 and 2014 this is about $100 a barrel. Oil was trading at about 100 and then oil prices plummeted and in early 2016 bottomed out at about 26.21 a barrel and have subsequently been trading in the 40s. Right? So my question to you is this. When oil was 100 versus when oil was in the 40s, do you think the industry performance was different? 
you think the industry did much better up here than it did down there? Okay, and that's the point about the industry. It doesn't matter what oil company you are, if the price of your product goes down by 50%, it's gonna be a lot harder to make money. Okay, so give me a publicly traded oil company. Exxon. All right, Exxon Mobil. All right, Schlumberger is more supply and equipment. We can look at them too next. Let's take Exxon Mobil as an example. <clears throat> so, RV in Bloomberg quickly allows you to compare against peers. <clears throat> and these are big publicly traded oil companies around the world. So Exxon, Shell, PetroChina, Chevron, Total, BP, etc. And Bloomberg has some standardized templates for data, but you'll quickly learn, you can go over here to custom, and you can get any data that you want. So one of the columns I'm going to look at is ROIC, which is a standard Bloomberg field. And I'm going to go to customize period, years ago, year minus three. So let's go back to 2014, when oil was $100 a barrel. That top line is the market cap weighted average ROIC for the industry. So it takes an average adjusted for size, so some tiny company doesn't distort the average. But basically, the average oil company worldwide was making about 9% ROIC, Exxon about 12.7. None of the big players were losing money. Most of them were high single digits to low double digits. That was the oil industry at $100 a barrel. Here is the ROIC as of the latest filing. That's 2016. 3%. Exxon, 3%. Most people consider ExxonMobil to be one of the best managed companies in the world when it comes to oil. And I'm telling you, there's nothing they can do that gets beyond the fact that oil prices are in the 40s. And no matter how well run you are, what are you going to do? And so that's why I mean by industry is actually just as, if not more important, than the company itself. Because there really is an industry level of return. And it's, there are some exceptions to this, but generally, it's very difficult to outperform your industry dramatically because the industry affects everybody. So that's actually why we're going to do something this semester called EIC over the next couple weeks. And that's why you're doing the economic certification in Bloomberg, because we have to understand how the economy, the industry, and the external environment affects the companies we're going to analyze. Right? And we got to understand future versus past. The biggest difference between accounting and finance, accountants look backwards. Finance people look forward. If I do my job this semester, what I'm going to train you to do in the next three months is to start looking forward, right? Because basically accounting, what do you do? You look at historical financial statements and historical financial results. Well, what you're really doing is you're driving a car down the highway looking exclusively in the rear view mirror. That's accounting. Now, if the road ahead doesn't have any obstacles and it's straight, great. The past explains the future. But if there's an obstacle in the road or the road curves and you're looking in the rearview mirror, you're going to crash. And there's nothing you can do about it. So a good finance person is looking forward. Now, it's not saying that we don't look at the past to help us understand the future, but it's much more future oriented. So what I care about, what Warren Buffett cares about is not just how's the oil industry doing today, but how's the oil industry going to be doing in the next five to 10 years? So the real question is, is oil going to stay in the 40s? Is it going to go back up to 100? Is it going to go to 80? Like, what is the price of oil going to be in five years? All right. Now, here's the thing. Three years ago, Warren Buffett owned ExxonMobil in his portfolio. He actually thought the oil prices were going to stay high, and he liked ExxonMobil, and he actually owned them. And then he dumped all his shares and got out of the oil and gas industry. Because his point of view now is that oil prices are going to remain low long term. Why? Why is there a point of view that oil prices are going to remain low? Yeah. All right. Renewable energy is part of it. But there's even a more important short-term catalyst. Yeah. It's actually less to do with OPEC. But OPEC is heavily influenced by it. Um, the supply of um, oil, the oil, crude oil produced is going to go up because now, like, since, like I know for Iran, since the sanctions have been lifted, now they're going to enter the global market. And That's right. But to be honest with you, Iran is not the problem. The biggest problem to OPEC is not Iran. It's who? 
US. It's the US. So what's going on with the US? Yeah, and, and so it's so basically the U.S. is now one of the biggest oil producers in the world, and through shale oil, which is what they're doing with hydraulic fracking, it's completely changed the dynamic of the industry so that OPEC no longer controls the price of oil. The U.S. has become the swing producer, right? So for those of you not familiar with hydraulic fracking or shale oil, there's basically two places in the U.S. where we have a lot of it. One is the Permian Basin in West Texas. The other is uh, North and South Dakota. And there's a huge amount of shale oil down there. And the way they do this is they actually do it horizontally, as opposed to vertically. And in order to get the shale out, they pump in water and sand and blast it. And then the shale comes out and it's replaced by sand. Okay, and then it spits out all the oil. And the US has perfected the technology so that the break even for shale oil is about $40 a barrel. So here's the thing. Three years ago, as you saw all the ramp up in US production, Saudi realized it was gonna be a problem because they needed to basically curtail supply, whole point of OPEC, and the US was expanding supply rapidly and Saudi was losing market share. So they made a strategic decision to wipe out the US producers. So the reason why oil prices went down like they did is because Saudi expanded production capacity to the point that it drove down low-cost oil to get the U.S. producers to basically exit the business. And it actually worked. They actually exited the business. But here's where Saudi Arabia miscalculated. What they didn't realize is how low-cost shale production was and how efficient it was to turn on and turn off so that when oil prices started to rise again, the capacity is shown back up. And that is what Warren Buffett saw, and that made him fearful about the industry. Because it's not just that Iran and others are in the market, it's that the US players are ramping up more capacity as prices start to rise, and that's put an implicit cap on oil that OPEC has not solved at this point in time. And to be honest with you, the latest thing I read is OPEC has actually invited the US to the table to join the cartel. Now, we're probably not gonna do that. There's a lot of laws against that in the US. But nonetheless, that's what they're struggling with. So the point is, like I said, unless there's a war or something else, it's odds are there's going to be a lot of supply going forward, and the UK, U.S. is now one of the low-cost suppliers in the world. And that changes the dynamic of the oil industry. So what I'm telling you is whether we're looking at any one of the companies in this list, or somebody mentioned even Schlumberger, which is the people providing equipment to this industry, this is what's going to matter to our point of view about their relative level of success on a go-forward basis. And so that's what I mean by we have to be forward-looking, we gotta look at data, and we're gonna have to start making different types of assessment when we do our evaluations. Questions, comments? Okay, so give me another company. And let's look up Schlumberger, is that S-C-H? S-L-B? There we go. All right, so here's Schlumberger, somebody just asked about them. And I actually have a template called spread. So you'll find out in Bloomberg, you can save these templates. And I have a custom formula called spread. So basically, it takes ROIC minus WAC, so I don't have to do my own math anymore, I'm really lazy. So this is the spread of the industry. Here's Schlumberger. Spread of the industry, negative 8%, because the industry had a negative 0.2% ROIC if you look at the top three players. It's no surprise that the people that are providing drilling equipment to the oil and gas industry aren't making money when the industry has a negative spread. They're borrowing at eight, they're making three, who wants to drill? Questions? Yes? The difference between ROIC and IRR? ROIC, think of it as a one period IRR. IRR is the rate of return over time. ROIC is just a snapshot of that period of time. But what I'm saying is when your IRR is below your R, and so I'll go back to oil and gas. If I add WAC to this list, when the current WAC of the oil and gas industry is 9% and the industry is making three, nobody's going to spend a lot on drilling. Nobody's going to spend a lot on exp exploration. Nobody's going to spend a lot expanding refineries, which is why sub-industry, Schlumberger, is really struggling. 
<clears throat> and by the way, in Bloomberg, supply chain, this is the supply chain for ExxonMobil. So we can actually see which other companies are supplying products to them. And Schlumberger is the sixth largest supplier of ExxonMobil. So it's not a surprise if Exxon's suffering that Schlumberger is suffering. All right, give me another company, another industry. Yeah. Uh, look at applied materials. Applied materials? Uh -huh. Okay. So let's look at applied materials. First of all, in case you don't know who applied materials is, DES gives you a brief description. So my guess is this is a semiconductor company? Uh, yeah. Okay, semiconductor company. They produce like more of like, they do more of like education, like, like, like basically like all your screens will produce like the solvent and like the, the material that they use to produce the LED. Like, uh, so last year, this industry is a group 22% ROIC against a 10.6% WAC, applied materials at 27%. So right now in their business cycle, they're actually doing pretty well. Who else? Another industry. Company. Gilead. <clears throat> Biotech. Gilead. If you look at the major biotechs last year, average 19%. Gilead was at 28% ROIC against an 8% WAC. NVIDIA. NVIDIA was 33% ROIC against a 14% WAC. 15% industry ROIC, 11% WAC. Profitable, value-creating industry, and NVIDIA doing really well, just like Applied Materials is doing really well right now. Um, Ford, autos. Terrible industry. Ford, 2%. Even worse. Their CEO was fired 60, 90 days ago because they're underperforming a bad industry. So <clears throat> this is the other subtle point I want you to start to understand. Certain industries are more attractive than others. Dynamics are different. We need to understand this. And if you're in the automobile industry, there's not much you can do. That's why some of these tech companies are looking at Tesla and like, Musk, you're crazy. Like Tesla's doing really well, but look at the industry that Tesla's in. And they're trying to transform this industry, but it's a heavy capital intensive competitive industry. And by the way, 2016 was one of the better years of the last decade for autos, and they still had a negative spread. And no one's really making any money in this industry. So I'll give you a, a clue to my rest of my life. On Thursday, I'm teaching in the Google Marketing Academy at Wharton. I've been doing it for the last three years. So I'll have 70 of the top marketing people at Google. And it's a fun class, because last time I was there, I had two of the product managers who were in charge of Google Home, their Google Home Assistant. And, and we were talking about it, because I was like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an Alexa house. All right? I have Amazon's my girlfriend, Amazon Alexa. I have like four of them. I'm all home, you know, homed up. I got my thermostats. I got my smart lights tied into my security system, all Alexa. And they were just like, you know, how do we get people to buy the home? And I was like, thank God you're not Siri. Siri is just horrible. But nonetheless, <clears throat> so here's the point. Uh, <clears throat> we're talking about that. And the other person that was in the class worked for a subsidiary in Google called Waymo. Anybody know what Waymo does? Self-driving cars. <clears throat> and I made a prediction. I'll give it to you outside of NDA that I made to them, that I'll make to you, and I've stated it publicly, which is you will never be able to buy, you the person in this room, never be able to buy a Google self-driving car. Not going to happen. That was my question to you. Why would I make that kind of prediction? That you will never buy a Google self-driving car. Because Google's going to self-driving car industry. You see the auto industry data behind me? Do you really think Google wants to get into that business? No, I don't. So, why are they building a self-driving car? No, they don't want to be Tesla. Who said it? What'd you say? Exactly. 
What I want to do is I want to prove the technology and I want to license it to every one of these people. Let them spend the billions of dollars not making money on the cars. I'm going to make money licensing it to every one of those people, including people like Uber and Lyft. So that's the point. Think about the economics of this. And I'll give you another example that will help you see this more clearly. I work with another company called Comcast. Heard of them? So here is Comcast. And FA in Bloomberg is historical financial results. So income statement, balance sheet, et cetera. But here's some supplemental data that Bloomberg has about Comcast historically, which are numbers of subscribers and price per subscriber. It's called ARPU, average revenue per user. Right? So if you have video, think X1 Xfinity platform video, they have 22.5 million subscribers paying about $83 a month for video. Okay? If you have high-speed data, they have 25 million subscribers for high-speed data, paying on average $45.65 a month. Okay? That's what you're paying for high-speed data from Comcast. Comcast, which makes an ROIC last year of a little under 10% in an industry making 11%, just thinking about their data business, is making $45 a month off of you spending billions of dollars to put fiber in the ground, switches, coaxial cable, everything else, to provide you content. Google makes $55 per user per month off of Comcast customers sitting on that network with no investment. Would you rather be Google or would you rather be Comcast? I'll take Google any day. And I'm telling you, I think the same metaphor is going to apply to cars. Why do I want to be Tesla? Look at Tesla. They burned through $4 billion of cash the last few years. They've never made a profit. They finally sold $80,000 worth of cars a decade later. And they're really struggling for cash. I'm not saying they're not valuable. But the flip side is, look at that black hole of cash to get to that point. And if I'm Apple or Google, why would I want to do that? I'd rather just prove the technology out, license everybody, let them do it, rather than trying to go fight for this new marketplace. So I'm not saying that Elon Musk isn't a pioneer, but if I'm Google sitting back at them, I'm like, I'd rather take the Comcast model than the Tesla model and try and recreate the self-driving car and how much trouble they're having for that. So this is where we have to start to understand business models, economics, etc. Matter of fact, <clears throat> here's the other thing that's happening in this industry. <clears throat> Netflix. Why would Netflix be in trouble if I'm looking at this data? What did Disney do about three weeks ago that would have affected Netflix business? They're going to remove what content? Yeah, specifically, all the Marvel movies, all of the Star Wars movies, all of the cartoons are going to leave Netflix in 2018, and they're not going to renew their contract. And they're going to have their own direct-to-consumer network that does that. Well, that's going to pretty much screw Netflix because Netflix makes its money not just through original content but packaging and reselling content. And the people giving them that content are no longer just raising the price. They're saying you can't have it at all and we're going direct-to-consumer. What happens when Comcast, which owns Universal, which has the Jurassic Park franchises and the Despicable Me franchises, and decides to do the same thing? And what happens to Comcast, or not Comcast when they do this, what happens to DirecTV when they do this? At the end of last semester, we were doing this as an industry, one of the group projects, and the Verizon CEO basically pulled a Jon Snow. Okay? So if you watched Game of Thrones last night, Jon Snow screwed up by being honest. No, you didn't? Sorry. For those of you who haven't watched it yet, I don't want to spoil it, but I'm just saying he pulled a Jon Snow. So for the rest of you, like, what the hell is he talking about? <clears throat> what the Verizon CEO said in May is he basically said, I wouldn't mind being owned by Walt Disney or Comcast. I don't think we should be alone. I think they should buy us. He actually said that publicly. If I'm the board, like, that doesn't make me excited about him as a CEO. Exactly. Like, he's in trouble. Now, why do you think the Verizon CEO said this? Why? He wants to be acquired, but why? Why would the CEO make that comment? You see AT&T on this list, 
Why is AT&T making 6.5%? Which looks terrible. ROIC. What did AT&T buy that killed their ROIC recently? Direct TV. And they're about to buy Time Warner. They bought Direct TV and Time Warner. What is Comcast? Comcast is end to end, where they have the content, Universal Studios, selling it through their Comcast network to you. Disney, which has all this value, doesn't have a distribution pipe to the user. AT&T just put up the distribution pipe to the user. Content is critical. You don't want to be the dumb pipe. Verizon is now just a dumb pipe. They don't have any content going through their system. And they're seeing, as everybody's fighting for content, how valuable the content is. And AT&T just spent a ton of money on content because Time Warner's Warner Brothers, which also owns HBO and Game of Thrones, can now be streamed on the AT&T network and Verizon doesn't have it. So what did Verizon say? We need a content provider. And we're not going to buy Disney, so Disney buy us. All right? Or we're not going to buy you Comcast, so Comcast buy us. But we have to partner up. And what I'm telling you is this is the changing business model. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but we have to consider if we're valuing a company like Netflix, if we're valuing a company like Verizon. And whether they made 15% last year is becoming quickly irrelevant to the valuation because if they don't have a future because they're increasingly getting lower cost and not access to content, then they're going to become a much more commoditized business in the future. And these are the types of issues that we have to deal with, and this is the data to help us understand this. Make sense? Okay, so in the interest of time, got about 10 minutes left. Cornerstone number two. Keep this one simple. <clears throat> it's not about the accounting, it's about the cash flow. Okay, so <clears throat> basically, accounting is a predictor of cash flow, but time value of money, timing matters. Okay, so the metaphor I like to use is accounting is like your pay stub. Let's say you were paid on August 1st. It tells you how much money you were paid for the month of August, but it doesn't tell you how much cash you have in your account on August 26th. And if I don't have any cash in my account today, things could get really bad for me. So that's the point. In finance, accounting predicts the cash flow, but timing really does matter. And so therefore, valuation is much more tied to cash than it is to accounting. So everything we do, is going to be looking at companies on a cash flow basis. And the whole point of the economic statements is to turn the accounting closer to cash. So it makes it for a more realistic valuation. So I'm not saying that accounting doesn't eventually get the cash right, but the timing differences do matter in the real world, especially when they're long. So cash flow, more important than accounting. Which leads to cornerstone number three. Yes. That's okay. Question? You will be doing DCF as part of the valuation this semester. Absolutely. And that's necessary. It is absolutely necessary. You can't do a valuation without a DCF. Right, right. But are there more factors within the DCF besides just value company? Or more what you're going to quickly find out is the math is easy. <laughs> the math to do valuation is easy. The art of valuation is the assumptions. It's anybody can put together a spreadsheet, but what's the cash flow and why? particularly when I forecast the future. What's realistic and how will that change? That's why we're having this other conversation. And that's what really matters to distinguish yourself from every other undergrad out there who learns how to do a spreadsheet in a DCF. Anybody can do that. I need somebody who can think because it's not what the spreadsheet says, it's how realistic those assumptions are. Now I'm gonna teach you how to think through assumptions. That's hard to do, but that will make you valuable. <clears throat> Leads to point number three, <clears throat> company value is based on expectations. It's called intrinsic value. We're worth the sum of the future cash flows, not the historical cash flows. Companies worth the sum of the future cash flows, present value to today. All of this <clears throat> comes from the University of Chicago, mid-1970s. <clears throat> That's where all of modern corporate finance was born. And they did one of their many studies, was at Chicago, <clears throat> on a punch car mainframe they put together a database in 1976 where they started in the U.S. from 1926 to 1975, stocks, bonds, and real estate. They took anything you could invest in the U.S. in those three asset classes on a quarterly basis, and they put the cash flows and the prices into this punch card mainframe database in 1976. They then turned the quants loose, and what the quants found was a one-to-one -one relationship between cash and price 
with the big data set over 50 years. Whatever cash those assets generated became the price in the marketplace. That is called intrinsic value, and that's what Chicago proved happened in the U.S. across stocks, bonds, and real estate over that 50-year period of time. They've subsequently updated that data set through 2016. Nothing changed. Over a long period of time, cash equals price. There's a warden professor named Jerry Siegel who went back to 1812 because we have data through 1812. Same thing, cash equals price over a long period of time. They then replicated the data set in Asia, Europe, Latin America, Africa, and Australia. Every one of those continents, same thing, cash equals price over a long period of time. We think today it's common sense, but it actually comes out of the Chicago research that says cash equals price over a long period of time. That was 1976. So here's the point. The value of a company is its future cash flows. So I don't care what you made in the past, because if I own you, I don't get the historical cash flows. I get the future cash flows. And whatever cash flows you generate become your price. That's the easy part. So if I take a company like Google, called Alphabet, how much cash is Google going to generate in the next 10 years? How much cash is NVIDIA going to generate in the next 10 years? I need to know that today. Because if you tell me that, I can present value that and figure out their stock price. So, what's the answer? A lot. A what? A lot. A lot. <laughs> I like that one. We need to be more specific than a lot. But that a lot is going to basically be a forecasted guess. We're going to guess. And here's the thing. Whatever cash flow they generate, the price will adjust. But today we're going to guess, and that guess is going to be priced today. In 10 years, when the data comes out, the price will adjust. But here's the rub. If I jumped into a ten mach time machine 10 years in the future from today, the previous 10 years don't matter. It's the next 10 years. So here's the interesting thing about finance. There's very few always, but I'm going to give you one of them. The price of any asset is always based on the expectation of cash flow. Is never based on the actual cash flow because we don't get to the future. Values are based on expectations, and that's what's critical. So if we don't understand what those expectations are, and how they're set. We have no idea why the price of a company is the price of a company. And that is one of the other things we're going to spend a lot of time on this semester. Was there a question over here? Saw my hand. Okay. So I want to give you an example of this. <clears throat> Somebody mentioned Gilead earlier in this class. So let me go back to Gilead. So here's Gilead. And here was their pure comparison. And the way you should think about ROIC, as explained in the book, is if you make a 28% ROIC, that means per dollar of investment, they're generating 28 cents of after-tax cash profit. <clears throat> so here's the thing. If I'm generating 28 cents of cash per dollar of investment, all things being equal, if I have any growth at all, I'm basically seeing the value of my company go up 28 cents a year. So the value of my stock should go up 28 cents a year if I'm making 28% ROIC, because I'm generating 28 cents of cash per dollar of investment. So here's the thing. For the last five years, Gilead has averaged 30% ROIC. I just kind of work with that industry so I know a little bit about them. So they've averaged 30%. What should be historically their stock price if they're making 30% a year for five straight years? What should the stock price chart look like? Almost a straight line up. Make sense? That's the intrinsic value principle. If you bought Gilead two years ago today, making 30% and 28% re respectively, growing that pretty rapidly, you lost 40% of your value. How does that happen? Because in the accounting world, does the past repeat itself? Yes. Go ahead. So here's the thing. There's a group of people called the sell side analysts. For Gilead, it's these 26 people working for these banks. So for example, Matthew Harrison of Morgan Stanley, Alethea Young of Credit Suisse, Michael Yee of Jefferies, Alan Carr of Needham, etc. These sell side analysts, which write the buy, sell, hold opinions, create an economic forecast, which they upload to Bloomberg called the Consensus Estimate Database. This is the wisdom of Wall Street and is the baseline financial forecast for Gilead. In 2016, Gilead had $30 billion of revenue. 
In 2017, 26 billion. 2018, 23 billion. 2019, 22 billion. Over the next three years, Gilead's expected to lose 20% of their sales. They're not being priced on a great 2016. They're being priced on a very rough patch they're about to go through. Because Gilead is the sum of its drugs, and there's a forecast by drug for the pharmaceutical industry going through 2020. And Gilead, which actually invented the cure for hepatitis C, which they had a patent on, that patent's about to expire. And in the pharmaceutical industry, there's something called biosimilar competition, which means I can use a biologic molecule which can bypass a patent and create a competitor for drugs that are on patent. And so because of that, they're losing sales of their top four drugs. And their top four drugs, 9 billion to 5 billion, 4.7 billion to 1.8 billion, 3.7 billion to 2.3 billion, and 3.6 to 2.4 billion over the next three years. Because to be approved, you have to go through four stages of testing with the FDA. There are no surprises in their pipeline of early stage molecules. And there's the forecast for the early stage molecules that Gilead is currently selling. If you look at the early stage molecule forecast, there's nothing of any size that offsets the $8 billion a year of revenue they're going to lose from their top four drugs. Hence, sell. I'm telling you, if you just looked at historical financial statements and you basically did your analysis and you said this is a great, predictable, steady company, you would have been wrong. And it would have been a disaster for you personally and for your clients as an investor. Must be forward looking. Must understand what's going to happen to this company and this industry. Yes? I, I don't know how big the acquisition is, but I've been predicting for six months when I work with Merck that Gilead will have to buy somebody. There you go. Because they have no future, they have to buy the future. So that is no surprise. We'll look at that on Wednesday. So thank you for pointing that out. But that's that's where actually the banks come in. Because if I'm J.B. Morgan, I'm running to Gilead and I say, I know you have no future. I know your stock price is down. So let's go figure out who to buy. Matter of fact, M&A, uh, here they are. Kite Pharmaceuticals, $10.1 billion, all cash bid announced today. And what's interesting is if I look at their advisors, who was the advisor here? Merrill Lynch, Lazard, whatever they are. And Skadden Arps is the, uh, the law firm. So that's the point. Merrill Lynch was sitting there in their CEO suite giving them options, and Kite was the one that came up because they have no future. And I'm just telling you, I've been talking about Gilead for a while, and it's no surprise to me they bought somebody because what else are you going to do? They're the company today, not the company tomorrow. So real quick before we wrap up, I'll show you one other quick one, Tesla. Tesla today is $345 a share, which means their market cap is $57 billion and change. And Tesla has never made money. Last year, they did $7 billion worth of sales. And these are their sales growth for the last seven years. By the way, last year, they lost $700 million. The more they sold, the more they lost. And the last three years, negative free cash flow, negative $4 billion, and they're running out of cash. By 2020, Tesla is expected to do $38 billion of revenue, $6.8 billion of EBITDA, and free cash flow of $1.7 billion positive. It's predicated on selling about 1.4 million cars. So here's the deal with Tesla. Last year, they sold 80,000 cars. There is no accounting metric created that will explain their stock price. <clears throat> the entire company is being valued on the fact that they're expected to go from 80,000 cars to 1.4 million cars in a four-year period of time, and that they will make a good amount of money in every single car. That's why Tesla is being valued. And by the way, if you take $57 billion divided by about, round off, $7 billion of EBITDA, what's 57 divided by 7? They're trading at about eight times forward EBITDA. That's not an unreasonable multiple, but that's the key, forward numbers. And the entire risk of Tesla is this. Can they actually sell and produce 
1.4 million cars because 683,000 are the Model 3. And they had a problem in their last quarterly conference call. And Goldman Sachs got really nervous about this because basically year over year deliveries were flat. Now they're supposed to be ramping up and they have all these back orders, yet they sold the same amount of cars last quarter as they did in the prior period. Why? Exactly, they're having production problems. They don't have enough batteries to actually make the cars that people want to sell because the Gigafactory is still not up and fully running in Nevada. And there's not enough battery capacity in the world to make these cars. So Tesla's like, don't worry about it. We're going to figure this out in the next 90 days. So I'm telling you, the downside risk of Tesla is not that they don't hit $38 billion in revenue. is they don't produce the cars that are on order because they don't actually have the know-how and capability to do this. Now, Elon Musk has been given credit for the company being able to figure this out. But at some point, if they actually can't deliver the cars, there's a lot of downside in Tesla's stock price, which is why a lot of analysts have actually jumped in the sell territory. And it's not that they don't believe it's the future. They just believe that scaling up to a million cars is a lot harder than it looks. And Tesla has not really figured that out. And before, people weren't worried about it. So now it's not about the demand, it's all about the supply. This is what we need to start to understand when we do valuation. This is kind of a peek into your future over the next several weeks. The good news is you're gonna learn how to look what I looked at Bloomberg. That's what the certification is gonna do. That's what the training is gonna do. There's a lot in this terminal, a lot of power. And the analysis, we're gonna practice a lot. So by the end of the semester, I'll be sitting down, you'll be sitting up here, and I'll be informed just as I'm informing you. All right, so this is a taste. See everybody on Wednesday.